Happy America, Chummers or is it Yukas or Ars regardless. I come to you in honor of America to bring you more tales of America San and his current erstwhile compatriots. The Clown, the Hippie, and the Mexican. The last run was long as hell. Extra long, even. In game terms, it was 2-3 to three months of bi-weekly sessions. In story time terms, we are looking at 2, maybe 3 story time threads. Although I'll try to crank him out faster than usual while I am, hopefully, briefly unemployed. Congratulate yourself, friends. You've made it this far, and now it's the home stretch. I've got about 10 pages of material prepped, and then I'll have to improvise off my notes. Expect a serious slowdown part of the way in, although that's probably for the best. I've got a lunch with GM, who is back in town from law school, tomorrow. But other than that I should be free to continue story timing tomorrow what I can't finish tonight. 8.58pm, the 23rd of February, 2074. Downtown Portland sirens rang through the night sky, accompanied by an R bulletin, spoken by a soft-voiced, feminine announcer. Attention, citizens. There has been a terrorist attack downtown. Large-scale police action is in progress. Please return to your homes immediately. Evacuate affected areas if at all possible, otherwise, locate the nearest authorities and they will direct you. Attention, citizens. There has been a terrorist attack. The grey SUV was burning rubber, making for the source of the explosion. Captain Danvers briefed his team as the driver, Perkins, dodges abandoned cars and fleeing people. Listen up, gentlemen. As of 1800 hours, Company 12 is active on the G contract. The finances are good, they've been cleared through shell companies in San Francisco and London and check out. We're moving into an active combat zone, but this isn't like Columbia, so pay attention. Our job is to get in, get the package, and get out, rendezvousing with companies 3 and 8 if possible, Bridges, Westlake, Jackson, and Ellis grunted in acknowledgement for Danvers to continue. Speaking of which, there are two packages. Priority Alpha and Priority Beta. Danvers brought up on our image of two identical black boxes. We want Alpha. Only difference between the two is that Alpha has a magical aura. So we'll put Westlake on it when we secure a package. Westlake, the team mage, nodded and adjusted the hermetic power focus dangling from his rifle's receiver. Command says that Chameleon already made off with Priority Beta. So we're looking at less AZT resistance around Alpha. But that doesn't mean we're not really in the shit today. Corpers are still swarming the place. Danvers paused as Perkins gestured for the team to hold on, and executed a tight turn through two stalled, empty police cruisers. And word is that big man is on sight. Danvers nodded to the combat hacker, Bridges, who saluted and then brought up a satellite image of a single orc wearing naught but an American flag bandana, a Yukus Veteran Administration armored jacket and a tattered pair of slacks. The orc was standing on the roof of the target building, surrounded by broken, exsanguinated corpses in the charred wreck of a helicopter. Report. Bridges. This is codename Big Man. Ilias is Garrett Jordan, Dervish, and America San. International Merc. Best of the best. Considered by command to be the second most dangerous living entity in the tip, after Hesterby. Org to all hell. Top tier Biaborg. Capable of speeds up to 140 miles an hour. Proficient in all firearms and guerrilla warfare. One of the reigning world masters of Sanga Wyacero. And suspected to also be one of the leading experts in Krav Maga. Jackson. A burly orc in full combat gear. Grunted. Did he do all that without combat armor? Danvers nodded solemnly. Before company one went silent. There was cone chatter about him dodging bullets. You see big man. You mark him on the tack nut and shoot on sight. We want all eyes on this son of a bitch. Perkins pulled the SUV to a stop amidst a parking lot in honking chaos. Riddles with the car wrecks of various nobles and high society wannabes who had tried to escape too fast. Gunfire sounded all up and down the block. Brief spurts of overwhelming noise as small firefights started and ended in instants. We're making for the roof. Gentlemen, said Danvers, knocking Ellis, the point man on the back of the helmet. Move the team slammed out of the SUV as a unit, navigating the mass of cars and scanning for potential combatants. 
The panicked civilians hit the asphalt as Ellis sprinted for the front stairs of the building, a regal old world affair now missing most of its roof and west wing. Engines roared overhead as a gunship did a pass, pouring fire onto the roof. A single unguided rocket flashed out from somewhere in the building, exploding in the air as the gunship yawed to the side. Somewhere in the distance, a dragon breathed fire, and the night sky lit like a torch. Contact Ellis, only feet into the building, ducked behind a pillar as gunfire rattled from amidst the fancy dinner tables set up in the great hall, shattering champagne flukes and plates full of foie gras. Jackson breached next, laying down suppressive fire with his assault cannon while Westlake circled around. With a cry of effort, Westlake levitated the table that the tango was hiding behind, leaving them open to two shotgun blasts from Ellis. Ellis vaulted tables and ran to the target, kneeling over the prone body. Tango down. He's in combat armor. Hispanic male. Has some kinda weird brain hairdo. As tech special ops. Commented Danvers. Probably separated from his squad. Make for the stairs. As the team approached the stairs, a lone kangaroo hopped by, looked at them awkwardly, and began hopping faster. What the he? Bend had provided all of the distraction that Dervish needed. Westlake was the first gone, in keeping with Shadow Runner policy. He gasped as a blur of steel caught him through the throat at over 120 miles an hour, sending a spurt of blood through the air and into Jackson's field of vision, broadcast to the entire squad simultaneously via Tacnet. It's big, the team spun to begin firing, but by the time that fingers were even compressing triggers, the blur had caught up the Jackson, who gulped throatily as a blade lodged itself in his upper spine protruding cleanly through his solar plexus. The mil-spec armor he'd invested so much personal money into tore like wet cloth. Jackson's death rattle sounded loud and clear over his cervical as the blade tore out through his flank so quickly that his body didn't jar, roaring through his chest plating like a can opener. Man Ellis, Perkins, Bridges, and Danvers poured rounds into Jackson's spasmodic, still standing body as Dervish boosted his skinners into a low roll sliding underneath the tables. Mid-slide, he pulled his shotgun from his bandolier and, one-handing it, began firing. His suburb legs bent backwards to right him at the end of the slide, catapulting him through a buffet table, spraying shrapnel and armor-piercing rounds. Ellis squawked as three apt slugs landed in his sternum, blowing baseball-sized holes out of his back. The remaining three survivors watched in horror through the tacnut as cameras pitched and biomonitors flatlined. Fuck Danvers dropped his in control attitude as he set his battle rifle to auto fire and began shooting at where Dervish had been mere microseconds before, continuing to slaughter the broken corpse of the buffet table. His periphery vaguely recognized a gust of pink mist where Perkins had been, and then Perkins' camera tilted as two legs, severed at the knee, spiraled into Danvers' field of view. He pitched to his right just in time for a grenade to land behind him, turning Bridges' feed into static. For a brief moment, Danvers saw a head wearing a brightly colored bandana straight down his iron sights. So he fired. And Dervish dodged. Danvers gasped as his gun fell in half, taking his left arm below the elbow and most of his right fingers with it. As he fell to his knees, the shirtless orc that was now standing in front of him grabbed him by the head with both hands, and spoke directly into his helmet cam. My name's not big man, said Dervish, calmly. It's America San. Dervish leaned in a so close that Danvers, quivering in shock, could smell his breath. It smelled like steak and overpriced champagne. The merc captain's vision blurred as he saw the protective Sibiri covers retract, giving him a good look into Dervish's cold Sibiris. Dervish positioned his mouth over Danvers' subvocal. This patched into command, scrubbed Danvers gulped an affirmative, letting out shuddering breaths. Dervish spoke softly. Feed me more mercs. Dervish stood back, still holding Danvers' head, and his Sibiri covers slid back into place. Wait no no no, the feed blurred, spun, and then cut out as Dervish popped Danvers' head off like a bottle cap. Noon, the 20th of January, 2074. Seattle you do 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 the voice of Terence Jackson grated upon Wildcard. Admittedly, it grated upon everyone. But Wildcard was the one who was currently hiding out in the Seattle U off campus housing, 
He tolerated Locke squatting in his suburban house until Locke had explained the full story of Felix Ramirez and his departure from as technology, at which point Wildcard decided that it was probably the best if he acted on one of his contingency plans, rented out his house to some subletters, and made for his backup safe house. This was, of course, on top of the ongoing animosity with Knight Errant, which lead Wildcard to be certain that he took no chances. A little plastic surgery to look younger, a new fake eyed, a cover story about getting a postgraduate degree in chemical engineering, and he was ready to assume the life of an exchange student at Seattle U until he was sure that the heat had blown over. The only downside was the roommate. Dude bro de debro runner dude wildcard fingered the nickel plated predator underneath his pillow, thought better of it, and popped his head up above the top bunk. What Jackson was wearing two polo shirts and both popped collars formed something reminiscent of a renaissance neck ruffle. Today's porn vid, if the slight spillover of sound from his headphones was any indication, was Big Elf Butts 15. It had been his favorite of late, Wildcard noted. Tracy Ross from Delta Kappa is putting on this sick party, and, Wildcard hopped onto the ladder, and slid down to the floor. The predator remained in its hiding spot. Yes, I recall you advertising the shindig as BJ City. Suffice to say I won't be joining, Jackson huffed. Oh man, I get as bad as international mercenary cat all up and hiding out in my apartment, and I don't even get to show him off none that's the idea, bro, chuckled wildcard, sliding a hold out into the concealed holster in his armored coat, not the Mortimer of London one, which was for special occasions, but rather the grey one that he frequently used to impersonate city service workers, and zipping up his duffel bag. Gone to be out of the place for a few days. Hangin with the boys, then business. Don't break anything and I can get you that deep weed that you wanted in time for Valentine's Day. Dude, you the bomb wildcard gingerly handled a mil-spec helmet retrofitted with a custom bulletproof ceramic faceplate designed to emulate a snickering punchinello. The eyes lit up as the inbuilt comlink booted. I know I am, Terence. I know, 1pm, Vulcan's Forge. Redmond Baron's Al, out Ang bent pulled his hand out of the slat in the talus mungo's door, instinctively licking the spot on his wrist where Vulcan had drawn blood. Look, I'm not even here to buy anything magic, complained Ben, wiping a daub of blood off on his tie-dye t-shirt. I just need a repair spell cast on my favorite smart jammer, it's got sea water in the wiring and you can't fix that normally. Same rules apply, same rules for everyone. Vulcan grunted from inside his bunker. Your cred's good. I'll be done with the jammer in a moment, I swear. You're just like the eyes, muttered Ben, kicking up Baron's rubble with his flip-flops, the eyes PSSSH. Amateur, a third slat in the door that Ben wasn't even aware of before, hidden amongst the armor plating, opened, and the jammer slid out on a mechanized tray. You have 30 seconds to get the jammer and clear the perimeter or else the turrets open fire. Nice doing business with you. Side Ben, slipping the jammer into the pocket of his chonglers and jogging for the edge of the kill zone. You now have 26 seconds, responded Vulcan through the loudspeakers, as a turret extruded from the roof of the bunker. 2 minutes past 2 pm, Dervish and Sensei's crib, Redmond Barons I'm serious, man. You've got to either go back home or find a new bolt hole, growled Dervish, searing a plate of real steak incongruously over an ancient, battered gas stove. Sensei and I have a pretty sweet deal here and the last thing we need as technology fucking it up, can't, responded Locke, sitting at the table, read, fallen concrete slab too heavy to bother moving, in his full battle armor periodically lifting the helmet to get a bite of his terrifyingly still good 1983 military mres. My safe house here in Redmond is doxxed, and Wildcard's pretty sure that they're watching his house right now. Well yeah, said Dervish, with a shrug. He himself was wearing a wife beater that he had not bothered changing for two days straight, but if they got pinged by Knight Errant, then they know about this place, too. And Ben's commune, behind an inch and a half of unbreakable plasteel, Locke's eyes widen. Fuck I didn't even think of that is there an underground escape tunnel? A secret vault here wait. No. Cool wildcard. We've got to go upstairs to the helicopter I looked up this volcanic island in the Philippines on my maps app. It said it was uninhabited so we can. 
Calm the fuck down, Locke, said Dervish, with a light chuckle. He reached into the pan with his bare hand, grabbed the steak with the insulated tips of his fingers, and promptly crammed the whole thing into his mouth. He spat bits of cow as he continued to talk. The guys are coming down anyway to hang out, and Cor can't make big moves in Redmond without causing a stir. Consider it early warning. Sensei finished a shake composed primarily of soy protein supplements, degrade hamburger patty, and raw egg. What did you say was happening tonight, son? Tread night. We're gonna use wildcard nexus to hook up a local R network, watch a bunch of trashy action flicks. You want and sensei blinked his blind, grey eyes at dervish. Oh, don't you fucking give me that, you could have got Sibri's a million times over, you just like telling the story of how the Aztecs blinded you that one time in Sao Paulo, and how it just made you more in tune with the spirit of Sanga Wyacero, you damn windbag. Sensei couldn't help but stifle a grin, guilty as charged, how can you be so calm Locke glanced at the boarded up windows, ducking for cover from an imagined sniper. There could be a team of Sean ones on their way here right now I got a haircut yesterday, but I'm not sure I count, said Ben, walking into the room with wild card and carrying a set of truly awful tread chips. Tsuki Red Flower Part 0, Origins. Smart jam is all fixed, so we're officially good to be back on the market. I jumped the gun on that one a wee bit, noted wild card, been going a little stir crazy. So Brianna's set us up for something two nights from now. She says it's a great big one. SK Johnson's lining up again. So get your suits laundered. Suits laundered we are under attack we don't see it but they could be flying in a tactical drone this very instant the entire team stared at locked blankly. Look, as he said Ben, miffed, if I go sneak into your old bolt hole and I don't find any Aztec warriors, can we put this conversation to rest for now? Snap lock, but he followed it up apologetically with, yeah. That would help my state of mind, a lot, I'll be right back, said Ben, with a roll of his eyes, as he began donning his ruthenium polymer suit of light mill spec armor, send a watcher spirit first, see if it catches anything obvious, 3.32pm, Felix's bolt hole, Redmond Baron's Felix's apartment block was only a 30 minute walk away, but Ben was nothing if not a consummate professional, and had snuck the entire way there, and then rather than beelining to Locke's bolt hole, was clearing the building room by room, nothing in the lower building, some weird magical trails, a mage might have been through here recently, if he's still in the building I'll report. Finally, Bend worked his way up the hallway, literally, given that the whole building was tilted, Titanic style, to Locke's bolt hole. The door had been wrenched off its hinges, but that was nothing new. Ben stealthed into the room, and did the unthinkable, the truly unfathomable, preposterous, even. He did something that those who knew Ben would list as the single least likely thing he could ever do. For the first time in his career as a spy or a shadow runner, he tripped, as in, physically. Ben caught his foot on a loose floor board, wall board, and, his cat-like reflexes briefly abandoning him. He face planted into Locke's kitchen. He looked up to see a tiny Aztec face staring back at him, its tongue lolling obscenely. Bend's heart tightened in his chest. Hi Bend you're the second person in this room Bend let out a whoosh of breath. Thank god. I thought you weren't one of Locke's spirits for a second. Wait. The second person in the room grabbed Bend by the throat, lifted him bodily, and slammed him into the wall. Caving floorboards. Bend found himself dangling from the outstretched arm of a man who was easily 7 feet tall, dressed in a leather biker's outfit. But, as Bend paid closer attention, which was hard, as he was currently being throttled a cool one and a half feet off the ground, he realized that it wasn't a man at all. Its eyes were synthetic and uncanny, and didn't have the telltale pink where the edges of the eye meet face. The same could be said of the lips which curved inward but then stopped at the teeth rather than continuing into the mouth, a plasticine mask rather than real skin. The texture of the skin was off, and on his throat Bend could feel a cling similar to a wetsuit. Bend's highly sensitive ears could hear the servos in the arm whining as the figure continued to hold him up, displaying almost no strain whatsoever. 
Its preternaturally calm face showed no emotion as its doll-like mouth opened and shut, approximating the words that were actually issuing forth from a high-quality speaker in the back of its throat, whereas Felix Ramirez bent gasped in pain. So the cyborg switched hands, easing up on his throat but using the other hand to shove against his torso, lifting him even higher against the wall. It repeated, where is Felix Ramirez Ben choked out, I don't know what you're talking about the cyborg's free hand split in half, the synthetic flesh rending as a rifle barrel extended from the forearm. Where is Felix Ramirez Ben felt a rib crack as he tried to struggle out of its crushing pressure. I don't know any Felix Ramirez the cyborg trained its gun on Ben's head. You know Felix Ramirez. Where is Felix Ramirez I'm serious where is Felix Ramirez stop asking that the cyborg paused for a moment, dipped its head in thought, and then let Ben fall down the wall again to continue throttling him, recognizing that the thing intended to capture him, Ben drew his heavy taser, put it under the thing's chin, and pulled the trigger. The cyborg shuddered spasmodically and sparks flew out of its ears and eyes. It froze in place, not letting go of Ben's neck. He continued to choke in its gasp, going blue. A synthetic computer voice issued forth from the cyborg's slack jaw. Initiando Sekuncha de Reinitio, Ben lifted his entire body up onto the cyborg's outstretched arm. He could feel his vertebrae stretching as all of his weight briefly rested on his neck, wrapped his arms and legs around it, and used the leverage to wrench his neck free of its grasp. He promptly fell off its arm and hit the floor hard, gasping for breath. Reinitio in dire segundos, his screaming muscles running on adrenaline, Ben lifted himself out the window, sprinted to the edge of the building, and bailed down to the street below, pulling into a tuck and roll, he shapper shifted into a kangaroo, packed his gear into his female kangaroo pouch, Ben believed that the utility made up for the body dysphoria, and made off as fast as he could, only turning around once to see the cyborg step into the streets. Resolute. A few minutes later, another watcher appeared in front of Ben. Hi Ben Felix told me to go talk to the kangaroo because I couldn't find you the first time what happened unfortunately. Ben had a bruised trachea and two broken ribs, and did not much relish the thought of Shapa shifting back now that the adrenaline has run out, just to talk. So, he scratched the words full body combat cyborg in the dirt and looked expectantly at the watcher. The watcher helpfully shouted. I can't read Ben tapped his kangaroo foot frustratedly at the words. Okay the watcher disappeared as it made back for its master. 4:12 pm Dervish and sensei's crib he gave me words lock flinched and pulled his sidearm reflexively as the watcher reappeared beside him, even though he had known it was coming. And what did the words say the watcher waggled its tongue and thought, and then scrabbled you late audio matey for toy dog on one of the filthy windows. Lock blinked. Yule Bardi Umba Oiborg Dervish, Wildcard, and Sensei all winced. Sensei sauntered over to a nearby filing cabinet and pulled a pair of reins out. Welp, I ma take the old three-legged horse out for a spin for a few days, Dervish grimaced. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You do that. Wildcard fiddled with his keys. I'm going to bring the car inside the complex then get the chopper warmed up. Locke promptly set his gun's safety off. Oh. Full body combat cyborg. I felt like an idiot there for a moment. Yep, the Philippines it is. Ben ran naked into the room and immediately began packing his bag. Dervish looked at the bruising on his chest and neck and reflexively asked, Whoa, what the hell happened my first mistake, grunted Ben, was trying to help Locke. My second was getting spotted by a watcher spirit. Dervish cringed, bad day Ben huffed. Really bad. Wildcard came over the team's comms as his car roared into the compound. Gentlemen, don't look now, but we have a visitor. Ben glanced through the boards on one of the windows to see the cyborg pulling up to the barbed wire fence on a motorcycle. It made eye contact with Ben, and then walked clean through the fence. Fuuuk, this is like right out of the Terminator Dervish hefted his sniper rifle, making for a firing position as Wildcard ran back up the stairs, sprinting for the helicopter. El Terminator I'd watch it, with the cacophonic boom, Dervish planted an explosive round in El Terminator's skull, taking a long line of flesh and hair off of its scalp and exposing a decoded titanium brain case. El Terminator lifted its arm and began laying down suppressive fire as Dervish hit the floor, covering his head on impulse from the shards of splintering wood. 
As the spinning of helicopter rotors began to disperse dust around the compound, Sensei rode his three-legged horse out the back. See you, son see you, dad, yelled Dervish, as he popped up to plant another round in El Terminator's head, to equally dramatic but ineffectual results. Good to go, said Wildcard, arming the helicopter's weapons. Jecha Fat rears up here way down with duffel bags and firearms. The team sprinted into the helicopter, and as Wildcard lifted off the roof, he got a missile lock on the cyborg. So long, Tin Man. The cyborg merely stared at the helicopter as the Hellfire missile raced toward it. The cyborg, missing all of its skin, its left arm, and a small portion of its torso, continued to stare up at the helicopter, its metallic eyes gazing unsettlingly through the smoky crater around it. Oh, you've got to be kidding me, said Ben, staring in disbelief through the cams. The sensors began blaring as Wildcard pitched the helicopter into a sprint away from Seattle, over the ocean. Locke's brows furrowed. What was that oh, nothing, the AS technology pyramid just launched interceptors. A metaplanar portal would be nice. Locke's eyes went wide. But Wildcard turned to stare at him, the voice modulator in his mask blaring unnervingly as, for the first time in their mutual careers, Wildcard yelled outright. A metaplanar. Portal. Might be. Nice. Locke's shell shock neurons connected, and he brought forth his great form guidance spirit. That island we talked about with the manaboon now Tanatia spun in the air and opened his mouth, beckoning the helicopter come inside as a pair of missiles streaked through the skies over Elliot Bay. In an instant, the helicopter was gone, and the missiles disarmed, deactivated, and dropped into the bay. And, as the interceptors darted back to the AS technology pyramid, the day went on much as it had in Seattle. 1.15pm, the 20th of January, 2072, a small island in the Pacific after a lengthy metaplanar jaunt, the helicopter emerged, battered from spirit attacks and other metaplanar shenanigans, over the island in question. It was a volcanic rock with a jungle around it, old school Bond villain material. Wildcard breathed a sigh of relief, glad to be free of the Aztec metaplanes. This the place lock nodded wordlessly. Yeah. Set us down on that plateau Wildcard gingerly eased the helicopter down, settling onto a mountain across from the caldera. Alright, gents. We've officially hit it big on AZT's shit list. Luckily, we're well out of their territory, the choppers stocked with emergency food and water for weeks. Dervish tore a can of baked beans open with his hands and guzzled the entire thing, for days, rather, and I can set up a connective hotspot to hit up some of our contacts for relocation. My personal suggestion is Italy or Germany, given that we don't want to blow off Cedar Krupp Johnson. Anyone know German nobody raised their hands. Anyone know Italian only wildcard raised his hand, although Ben gave an A sideways hand signal. Italy it is, let's hide out here as long as we can manage, commented Locke, who was eyeing the jungle warily out of the helicopter's window. I don't doubt that nearly wasting that cyborg made me any less of a target. Ben nodded. Agreed. Especially because it'll give us more time to lay low. Ply the airwaves, work out our options. Locke glanced at Ben. Ben looked at him, looked back at Wildcard, and looked at Locke again. I thought for sure that you were going to give me shit for getting us into this. I thought I would. Too. Sighed Ben. I thought I would. Too. Dervish promptly opened his second can of beans, this time with his teeth, as Wildcard set up a field comb and opened up an encrypted wireless network. The team distributed disposable cum links. They would all work their contacts for all they were worth, to make an international transition to Italy as smooth as possible. Wildcard hit up his old fixer, Luca. Ben called up Geppetto. Locke called Brianna's special line to let her know to postpone the Johnson meet as far as possible without angering the Johnson. And Dervish sat on the edge of the mesa and overwatched the birds flying over the jungle. What? Said Dervish with a shrug to the rest of the team. My only notable contact is Sensei and he's busy riding away from as technology on a crippled horse, with a little collaboration, and promises of vouching and future favors. Luca and Geppetto managed to get in touch with a few capos of Don Ferretti, the head of the Alta Commissioner in Sicily. Geppetto arranged for a preliminary parking spot in Palermo for the helicopter, an empty lot guarded by corrupt cops, 
He snarkily closed his conversation to bend with don't call me again unless you've actually been shot, while Luca ordered four fake sins to be delivered upon landing, with the natural expectation that they would be paid off. He also reminded Wildcard that it was traditional to pay respects to Don Ferretti upon entering the city, and that the team had best remain humble and on their best behavior. Locke actually had the most interesting conversation, as Brianna let him know, a few hours later in the day, funny you should plan on Italy. Johnson's employer is in Italy, and has decided to handle the meat personally. More information forthcoming. The team was so preoccupied with planning that, even as they milled about their unoccupied rock, they didn't notice the small Japanese man approaching. The man was bald, perhaps 5 foot 3, and wore an old style kimono in a warm red. He looked between the three runners, his mouth hanging open slightly, as though doubting their existence. Dervish was the first to notice, and let his hand rest on his gun while he chipped the old Japanese soft from Neo Tokyo. Hey guys, we got company, there was a brief silence as the whole team stared at the old man in the kimono, who stared back at them, the old man waggled his arm experimentally, as though expecting the runners to act like a mirror, finally, he spoke, what are you doing on my island lock, the only one without a Japanese skill soft, who wasn't bend, who was fluent, asked, what's he saying he says it's his island, grunted dervish, turning back to the old man, look, this island isn't registered to any private or public ownership, so it's not yours. We're just squatting here for a few days, so how about you back off the old man blinked and gawked at Dervish, looking more in awe than mad. Dervish looked between Wildcard and Ben. He said, in English, what's his problem Ben frowned at Dervish. I don't know, I guess he's just a hermit and doesn't know what shadow runners are or something. In Japanese, again, I know what shadow runners are. The old man looked at Ben, his facial expression one of utter confusion. He continued to look expectantly between the runners, as though expecting a reaction that he clearly wasn't getting. Wildcard tapped at the chip in the back of his neck, wondering if the translation was somehow faulty. These kinesics were weird. Okay, said Ben, forcing a smile. You know what shadow runners are. Great. Well, we don't mean you any harm. We're just hiding out for a few days and then we'll be on our way. How about you go back to wherever it is you live? Alright hell. We'll even pay rent. I don't want to be paid rent. Ben threw his hands up in the air. Sir, is there something we can help you with? He muttered in Sparathiel. Audible to lock. This is so surreal. No. I don't need to be helped with anything. This is my island. I don't want shadow runners on my island and I think I've been very polite. Well. That's all well and good, sir, said Wildcard, his Scottish brogue butchering his Japanese, and yes, you have been very polite, but there are extenuating circumstances and we can't leave, we're very sorry but we can't leave yet, the old man gave Wildcard a thousand yard stare, now entirely slack jawed, he gesticulated at Wildcard, as though he expected the gestures to make something click that hadn't been accounted for, however, as far as Wildcard could measure. It was still just a tiny old Japanese man standing by their helicopter, acting weird. Alright, let's start again, said Ben. We're just going to be here a while and we don't want to be a burden. I'm Sean, and these are Clarence, Garrett, and Pablo. What's your name? The old man stared directly into Ben's eyes. His expression completely blank. Ben began to realize what the expression was. He'd seen it in California before. It was the expression of someone used to being recognized, not being recognized. My name is Ryu Mayo and you're trespassing on my island. Huffuck. Great dragon and counter count. One. Wow. We're sorry, sir. We didn't know that this was your private island. And we'd like to beg your forgiveness and that you please not eat us. Babbled Ben. Um. We were actually recommended to come here by some guys doing a really shady deal. So I think this was all a part of a double cross and really, you'd be playing into it by killing us. Wildcard punched Ben square in the jaw, decking the infiltrator flat. Panicked, his voice took on more of his accent than usual. You retry and tie bullshit a greed dragon. Yeah numpty poof don't try tie bullshit greed dragons how do we know he's real? Yelled dervish. If he were the real Raimaya he would have killed us by now don't fucking test that. Yelled Locke who tackled Dervish as Dervish made for his gun, 
the team quickly devolved into two scuffles. As all involved parties tried to reciprocate panicked violence while desperately fleeing outright for the helicopter. Ryan Mile continued to blankly steer, looking more confused than ever, and slowly followed the team back to the helicopter. I'm not going to kill you, yeah here tha yeah fecking Jesse you tried to bullshit him and now he's gonna kill us Felix, so help me, give me back my gun, I'm not going down without a fight, Ryan Mile repeated, with a roar in his voice this time. I'm not going to kill you, the team went silent, and Ben removed his taser from where it was pressed against Wildcard's thigh. Oh, well, that's nice of you, yes, said Ryumayo, planting his face firmly in his palm. Yes it is. Please get back in your helicopter, Ben put his hands up as he retreated into the helicopter. Sir, I'd just like to remind you how sorry we are. I don't care. I have imbued your vehicle with the ability to temporarily move at exponential speeds. Please use it to leave and never return. Yes, said Wildcard, settling into the controls. Yes, we'll do that. The helicopter remained firmly in place. Um, said Wildcard, fiddling with the course mapper. Where are we gonna go Italy? Said his other three teammates, simultaneously. Right. Italy. We're going there. Right. With the sonic boom, the helicopter suddenly launched into motion in the general direction of northwest. As the helicopter slowed down from its brief stint of super speed a few hours later somewhere over Mongolia, Bend reached into his duffel bag with a quivering hand, drew a joint, lit it, and began drawing frenzied breaths. Dervish was the first to say it, fuck, fuck, agreed wildcard, from his position at the controls. Fuck me, said Ben, foo Lock chimed in, there was another silence. About 30 seconds later, Ben physically jumped on top of Lock, screaming like a jungle primate through teeth gritted around the joint. Some fucking uninhabited island so help me if I wasn't a pacifist I'd be throwing you out of the helicopter right now you deadbeat lowlife Mexican fucking piece of shit never learned anything in your fucking azzy bullshit school you baby eating fuck we could all be dead right now we could all be dead and eating right now and you had one damn job and that was to find a fucking uninhabited. Dervish put Ben in a full Nelson, although that only barely dimmed Ben's fury who began to kick wildly at Locke with his legs while his screaming slowly devolved into a single, primal, bestial hunting cry, his veins protruding dramatically from his face and his eyes completely bloodshot. Dervish struggled to keep hold of him as he turned into a chinchilla, shed his fur, turned back into an elf, and proceeded to continue bashing Locke's head against the side of the helicopter. Dervish put Ben in a sleeper hold, and looked pleadingly at Wildcard who shrugged as Ben began to bite hard into Dervish's arm, failing to break the strength and skin. It was going to be a long trip to Sicily. 8.27 am, the 21st of January, 2074, Palermo, Sicily the team, battered, bruised, sleep deprived, and exhausted, settled onto the dirt lot in Palermo as two shady looking men in Italian motorcycle cop uniforms waved them in. It had taken a few more calls to move all of the planning back to the day of, but it was done. However, the team owed their contacts a lot for this one. Wildcard stumbled out onto the lot, bleary eyed. He grumbled in Italian, hey, I have a flight manifest and a list of goods, and our passports are on the way. One of the cops shook his head. You the guy the guy the guy. Wildcard took a moment to think. I am the guy. The cop looked at his partner. He's the guy, yep, he's the guy. Both cops put up a police barricade by the lot. Nothing to see here, people clear out just arresting these here international criminals right now you didn't see nothing wildcard side with happiness. It was refreshing to see authority figures so, complacent. He rapped twice on the side of the helicopter, hearing the groaning of his napping teammates inside. Would you gents mind escorting us to a restroom of some sort we have our suits in the helicopter but we're all rather, disheveled. One of the cops looked at his watch. The other clucked his tongue, nodding, yeah. We don't got anything like that down at the precinct, so we'll just have to skip down to Don Ferretti's villa. The other cop agreed, his expression neutral behind his aviator sunglasses. Yes, I hear that Don Ferretti is very generous about the use of his restrooms. Let's go there and not to the precinct, because the criminals need to use the restroom, 
and neither of us is aware presently of anything of that sort to exist at the precinct, and we wouldn't want to infringe upon their rights, concurred the first cop. Wildcard could almost cry. The meeting with Don Ferretti was relatively uneventful. The Don was an old, dignified man, but lacked much of the haughtiness of power, and so took no offense at the rather eclectic gaggle of runners gracing him. If anything, he derived amusement from it, a change from the norm, with wildcard facing. The team negotiated a brief, paid for stay at the Ferretti villa, with the team sharing two bedrooms between them. They were promised safety, security, and, most importantly, a stable contact base to operate in Italy. So long as they continued to pay, the helicopter would remain a crime scene and they would be under protective custody in the villa. Noon, the 22nd of January, 2074 only after a day of taking in the sights in Palermo, which did wonders to calm the team's rattled nerves, did Brianna get back to the team? I got in touch with Johnson's employer. Wildcard put his mask down, answering the call and gesturing for the rest of the team to do the same. This point in time found the team having lunch at a roadside cafe, PR watching and playing spot the Goomba. The running ratio was 1 for every 15 civilians. Oh he's an old school professional, says he Johnson back in the days of Saratech. And the one who got pulled off the job here isn't exactly an unprofessional Johnson, he's the same guy from the UO run. Which means we're looking at a big, big job here. If SK's using two Johnsons as middlemen, Dervish thoughtfully chewed on a piece of ravioli. You think it's him Lothwit? I mean calling the shots on this one I doubt it, responded Brianna, but anything's possible. You boys have something of a reputation, especially you, Dervish. Dervish grunted. Regardless, continued Brianna, unless he comes out and says it's Lothwit, don't ask. But you already knew that by now, so this new Johnson, said Ben, what do you have on him Ben continued to pick out his terrible vegetarian panini, wincing with every wilted, dry bite. Not much to go on, responded Brianna, says he retired from Johnsoning decades ago, but got pulled back into this on a favor, works as a professor now. Some kind of European, maybe German, maybe Italian couldn't pin the accent, any guidelines old school Johnson meets are a lot less formal, you'll like it. You're meeting him at the Fortunato El Pantheon restaurant in Rome in two days, oh, and guys lock nodded reflexively, yeah get new suits, really, really good ones, on your dollar you fucking wish, dervish laughed. Take care of yourself, Brianna, likewise, guys. This is, this is the big one. The team decided to not fuck around for this Johnson meet, under the assumption that, as of the phone call, they were on the job of making a good impression. A fancy hotel room near to the restaurant was rented, four flight tickets to Rome were purchased, and the suits, suits were researched. Eventually the team settled on the Milanese A. Carasini, a long sending family business, with a less is more philosophy. The team assumed, perhaps correctly, that an old school Johnson would appreciate such a hearkening back to old fashioned moors. And they guessed correctly, as the team filed into the back room of the restaurant, where they found, sitting across an intimate table, a lone, grey haired dwarf, wearing an old style, understated suit, much as they were. Greetings, said the dwarf, in his untraceable, vaguely European accent. He had a warm smile, reminiscent of the pastel cells on an old Disney feature. You gentlemen can call me MR, Johnson, and none of that only the face talks horror. We're going to have a nice dinner before we talk business, that's a surprise, said Wildcard, accepting a glass of wine from Johnson. It shouldn't be, responded Johnson, a little taken aback. This business used to be a trusting community, before the internet went and mucked it all up. Tell me about yourselves, not much to tell, really, said Wildcard, I'm a bank robber from Edinburgh, back when it still existed, yeah, and I got into the biz from organized crime, it's something of a thrill seeking jaunt, Dervish grunted, I'm Dervish, I woke up in an alleyway and don't remember shit, I'm in it for me, I guess, there's a bi-monthly Dow Jinchi about me called America Sam, Johnson chuckled, yes, some of my students are familiar with your wacky antics. Tell me, are the stories involving the only true what? 
The red one Johnson shook his head. Blue. I believe. Apparently you hit him with a motorcycle. Dervish scratched his chin. Nah, I never. The only was red. And I. I really wish I'd hit him with a motorcycle. Damn. Johnson left Dervish to his reverie and turned to Ben. Ben. X intelligence. Don't want to expand on it too much. MR. Johnson. I figure information is an advantage. Johnson pursed his lips at Ben. Oh, please. Maybe in the Johnson meets you're used to, but here we're friends first and clients second. Honestly, he scoffed. Americans. Thinking everyone else is out to steal up your little slice of the pie. If it makes you feel any better, I'll tell you a little about myself. Johnson cleared his throat. I'm from Prague originally, and maintain a tenured position at the university there. Magical studies, as it were, as you can tell from my then unique physiology. I was quite on the ball with the whole magic thing from day one. Johnson laughed at a joke he hadn't made, and then continued. Suffice to say, my unique skills have got me involved with Cedar Crook, who I'm doubtless sure that you're aware you're working for, although my relationship with them was always transitory and on a by necessity basis. He took a sip of his wine, much as is your relationship with them. I imagine. I'm here now as part of a very big favor to a very old friend in the company, if you'll believe it, although that makes it sound much more ominous than it really is. And you. Johnson pointed at Locke. You are Felix Ramirez. Famous fugitive. Are you aware that as technology has put up wanted ads all over North America Felix stared at his wine and mumbled. Well, I guess I'm happy that I'm not in North America. Then, Johnson laughed again. And an earnest one at that. He seemed to just be a very jovial man in general. Alright, gentlemen. Now that introductions are out of the way, shall we begin Locke nodded. The negotiation no. The dinner, the team enjoyed themselves throughout the dinner, humoring Johnson's many stories about the good old days of deckers and trench coats. Finally, over a horribly unhealthy cream dessert, and after everyone had partaken well of the wine, Johnson gestured for the servers to disappear. Now, regrettably, comes business, gentlemen, about bloody time, we're shadow runners, we don't have time for fun, chortled wildcard. Causing a laugh to circle around the table. Now, I don't intend to be the flighty Johnson and withhold information. But some of this is on a need to know basis. That said, here's what I've been clear to tell you. Johnson brought up a mugshot of a handsome but nondescript Hispanic elf. He actually rather resembled Locke. This is Rodrigo Alvarez. As technology's foremost company man. He's one of the biggest runner killers in the business. To say nothing of what he's pulled off on rival core. Don't bother taking the picture to heart. He's a face changing adept. As tech tradition. Likely. But don't discount hermetic or path of the wheel. Johnson pulled up another image. This one of a sealed black box. Speaking of magic and dealing with other core. That's the crux of this job. My old friend. The one in Cedar Crook. Had a very powerful item stolen from him by Mr. Alvarez. It should be kept in a special environmentally controlled case. Pictured here. Locke raised his hand. And Johnson gestured for him to speak. Is it magical very? But the case should hamper that somewhat. Regardless, you can still sense it to make sure it's in there. Which is the important part. Wildcard spoke up. What is it Johnson grimaced? Need to know. I'm afraid. And, in fact, at great risk to your lifespans were you to- Got it. Said Dervish. With a nod. A sense the box. But don't look inside. That's the spirit. Chuckled Johnson. Now. My employer wants it back from Mr. Alvarez. Or whomever currently holds it. Dervish mocked bracing for impact against his fine leather clad seat. The catch incoming. T-5. 4. 3. Oh. Stop that. Giggled Johnson. But there is a catch. Isn't there always you see. Mr. Alvarez has gone a wall. He deserted as technology, whom are rather infuriated with this whole debacle, given that they were presumably the ones who orchestrated the theft. He's been underground for a month, but recently resurfaced, albeit very briefly, in Titangaya. Locke raised an eyebrow. You didn't get him then tried, but missed the man and the object. A total botch. And this is Drake Prime we're talking about. To give you an idea of exactly how wily the snake is, Bend asked, any idea why he'd be in the Tira hypothesis? Sighed Johnson. 
The Tibor season is upcoming. Princes, festivals, expositions, people pouring in from far and wide, the whole circus. Rodeo Circus Circus is probably the better term, said Wildcard. Go on. We think he plans to sell the artifact to someone. Maybe one of the non-Aztec megacorps. Maybe to an independent buyer. Maybe to the tip. And he's using the party season as a smoke screen. So, you're on a time limit. Although regrettably I don't know what exactly that limit is. So, said Ben. The mission is to enter the tip. Figure out who the buyer is. If there is a buyer. Beat Alvarez. And get the artifact to Cedar Crop without removing it from the case. Johnson nodded. That is correct. And what do we do with Alvarez irrelevant? Kill him if you must. But I'd prefer this be accomplished with that little violence as possible. Although I fear that may be unavoidable. Dervish snorted. You and me both. Buddy. If Omega's involved. Got a Prisa tag 200,000 plus expenses. An unlimited account to be cleared personally by me. Paid for airfare and lodging. And a negotiable bonus. The entire team gawked. Locke put down his spoon with a loud clink. You heard me, said Johnson. The price, by the way, is non-negotiable, unless for some unearthly reason you wish to negotiate down. Take it or leave it, that's the bounty for retrieving the, the object that even Drake Prime couldn't. Wildcard's eyes twitched in his head as he furiously browsed his internal comlink for some kind of precedent, while Dervish, Locke, and Bend continued to gawk. Finally, Locke commented. Stupidly, that's a lot. Yes, look, it is. This isn't a setup for a paltry double cross, either, as I hypothesize the artifact to be worth approximately 1000 times that value alone, albeit with the ticking time bomb of my old friend's animosity tied to its ownership. Take it or leave it, gentlemen. Dervish nodded. I'm in, Ben gritted his teeth, but nodded as well. Me too, Locke smiled. And me. Wildcard Wildcard blanched in his seat, catatonic. Locke patted him on the back. Wildcard watched yes the entire team looked at him expectantly. Uh, yes, yes, consider me tie be in, it's settled. Then, smiled Johnson, reaching a hand across the table to shake hands with Locke first, and then working his way around the table. I'll book you the first suborbital back to Seattle, under your new Sicilian aliases for obvious reasons. Everyone cringed when they shook Johnson's hand. His body temperature was very hot, not burning, but equivalent to a very high fever, and probably some kind of magical effect. Wildcard cringed more than his teammates. As the team left for the streets of Rome, Locke patted Wildcard on the back. I take it you found something out during the Johnson meet what is it it seems pretty big going by your reaction. Wildcard brought up an R window, and meekly commented, found Johnson. Oh, hell no, gulped Ben. Locke remained silent but began fiddling with his tie neurotically, just scrolling up and down the window as though he'd see something different. And Dervish just laughed, and laughed, and laughed, bracing himself in the arch of a nearby doorway. The fucking old friend bit. He got us good, laughed Dervish, leaning on his knees. It was a news article dating back to 2061, picturing a tall, handsome man with silver hair shaking hands with M.R. Johnson, the comparatively underwhelming dwarf, both were being photographed in front of a podium, and the images of dragons had been superimposed behind them. The article read, Lothwer and Schwarzkopf meet to discuss pharmaceuticals buyout, great dragon and counter count. Two Great Dragon and Counter Count. Three Shadow Run Story Time 19 The Final Run Part 1N. Look, I don't really want to say too much now. All I'm going to say is there's only two parts left. I'm going to be getting them done this week. So no more fucking about. I love this story. It's taken me far too long to get it out. So we're just going to fucking do it. You know what I mean? So, uh, like, hope you boys have enjoyed the ride. I don't really want to comment too much because, as I say, it'll be over very soon. And then that's when we'll talk about it. But uh, the only other thing I want to add is if you enjoyed the music, um, go across to my other channel, High Wavy. It should be linked down below. If you're interested in Synthwave at all, check it out. I think it's a lot of fun. So, uh, look, you boys just wait and enjoy. We'll get there. All right, see you tomorrow. So I've recently moved Nick Badia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just.